Well, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Roland Paris and director of the Center for International Policy Studies and on behalf of the Center and also the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs here at the University of Ottawa, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker for today, Steve Cole of the New America Foundation. Steve spent uh, 20 years as a foreign correspondent for the Washington Post and, and uh, as senior editor and he served as that newspaper's managing editor uh, from 1998 until 2004. He's written uh, six books. He's a regular contributor to The New Yorker. Uh, but for those of us who are particularly interested in Afghanistan, he may be best known as the author of the magnificent book Ghost Wars, The Secret History of the CIA, Afghanistan, and Bin Laden from the Soviet Invasion to September 10th, 2001, which won the 2005 Pulitzer Prize for general nonfiction. Now, it wasn't his first uh, Pulitzer Prize, by the way. Uh, he also won one in 1990 for his reporting on the Securities and Exchange uh, Commission. Although he writes uh, widely on foreign and security issues, uh, the topic of his presentation today is focused on Afghanistan and specifically the U.S. exit strategy from that country. <coughs> it's a topic, obviously, that's especially timely given the events of the last week in Afghanistan, following the grotesque mistake of the U.S. military's burning of some copies of the Quran at the Bagram Air Base uh, just north of Kabul, and the violent protests and, uh, and attacks uh, that have occurred since then, including an attack on two senior U.S. officers in the Afghan Ministry of Interior, which prompted NATO to pull all of its personnel, military and civilian, out of Afghanistan government ministries and departments. Given that NATO's exit strategy hinges on the mentoring and training of Afghan army and police forces, including by a still sizable contingent of Canadian armed forces, the level of mistrust that we've seen displayed in recent months and acutely in the last week raises questions, at the very least, about the viability of that exit strategy and the role that Western military forces may play in Afghanistan through to 2014 and potentially beyond. We're really fortunate uh, to have with us somebody today who's in a position to comment knowledgeably about these developments. Uh, not only does Steve have the background, but he has uh, traveled very recently to the region, Afghanistan and Pakistan, and I know that we're all eager to hear what he has to say, so without further ado, please welcome Steve Cole. Uh, th thank you, Roland. Thank you all for for coming out. Uh, much appreciated. I know there are uh, people here who know quite a lot about Afghanistan and, and some who are, are coming to the subject as uh, just interested citizens and readers. I'm going to err on the side of being a little bit uh, serious in the way I um, talk about um, U.S. exit strategy from Afghanistan, but um, I want to leave lots of time for questions. I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes or so. Uh, and then uh, if I've um, uh, been too confusing or dense, I hope you'll correct me in the questioning uh, part. But uh, this is really a vital transition uh, that's underway over the next year or so for Afghans who have suffered, after all, pretty much continuous warfare since 1979. Um, the international community came to Afghanistan after September 11th, made extravagant problem promises, uh, and now uh, will be measured against its conduct under pressure over the next four or five years. And so I do think the way the United States leaves Afghanistan, um, or certainly drastically reduces its combat presence there, uh, is not just a matter of interests, but also a matter of honor and um, a matter that uh, involves an enormously costly period in the lives of Afghans as well as Americans and Canadians. So there's quite a lot at stake. And we were, just, we were talking at lunch about how exhausted everybody is by this subject. And there's a tendency in the West to blame the Afghans for the problems that have accumulated during this intervention, uh, equally to blame the Pakistanis uh, for uh, allowing Taliban to operate from their territory as if that was the only reason that the United States was struggling uh, to achieve its goals in Afghanistan. 
And uh, the reality is that uh, this transition is going to be very, very difficult. And the assumptions on which the American exit strategy are based, as I'll try to illuminate in my time here before we get to your questions, are, are flawed, I think, in important ways and need honest reassessment. Uh, there's not a lot of time to undertake this reassessment, but I think it's important because of the stakes. Now, um, Afghanistan has a history of armies leaving under pressure. And so one way to think about the U.S. exit strategy is in comparison to historical models. Uh, famously, uh, one exit by a British expeditionary force of 40,000 in 1842 didn't go very well. Um, the entire uh, force was slaughtered on its way to Jalalabad, but for one man. Um, that uh, example um, has perhaps too often congealed into a cliche and governed a, a Western thinking about Afghanistan, but it is a reminder, as are some of the other viral revolts that have occurred even more recently in Afghan history that um, the Afghan body politic is infused with nationalism and can change its mind about its uh, friends and enemies pretty quickly. Uh, indeed, one of the reasons why there's so much anxiety about these events over the last week is the fear that having signaled that the West is headed to the exits, uh, inevitably there is um, a change in the incentive structure that Afghans see now. And there's a temptation, I think, for actors to move, whereas when they thought the international community was going to be in Afghanistan for an awfully long time, the incentive structure was, no matter what your ambition, politically or as a militia leader, the incentive structure was to wait, wait it out. Let's see how this plays out. Now the change is on the horizon, and there's a great deal of risk accumulating in the transition. Now, uh, I think the American exit strategy is obviously not modeled on the exit strategy of Lord Auckland in 1842, uh, but it draws from two sources that I wanted to describe quickly. One is the Soviet Union's exit strategy, and the second is the perceived lessons that the United States learned in Iraq as it was leaving that country. Uh, essentially, if you can attribute to U.S. exit strategy coherence and a full, fully uh, formed plan, which I'm not sure you really can. There's a series of plans running in parallel uh, inside the strategy. But it, to the extent that you did, you would say that it was made up of those two models. I think there's a self-consciousness about the Soviet model as an example, uh, and then there's a self-consciousness as well about lessons learned in Iraq Notionally, American generals and commanders will say, well, we, we're cautious. We're not trying to transport lessons that were specific to Iraq to Afghanistan. We recognize these are two very different countries, and certainly that declared position is often there. The reality is I think they're doing quite a lot of that. They're taking a lot of what they thought of as the blueprint in Iraq, picking it up, laying it down in Afghanistan, and it is not working the same way, um, to be honest. Now, what was the Soviet exit strategy? First of all, just to remind all of ourselves. The Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan in 1979, fought a counterinsurgency war throughout the 1980s against pretty much a united Afghan population. The portion of the Afghan population that collaborated with the Soviets was um, small in comparison to the great plurality of Afghans that have cooperated with the international presence since 2001. The Soviets waged a scorched earth, brutal campaign, a lot of aerial bombardment of civilians and villages. Um, but gradually, as after 1985, uh, when Mikhail Gorbachev gave his bleeding wound speech, uh, the, Af the Soviet Politburo accepted that they could not win a military victory in Afghanistan. And so they began to plan for a transition that ultimately led to the signing of the Geneva Accords and the exit of Soviet troops from Afghanistan in uh, early 1989. One of the Soviets' big concerns during that transition was force protection. They were afraid, looking at the British example, that they were going to have an unhappy trail up north and out of the country. In fact, they succeeded in exfiltrating all of their uh, forces 
They left behind a small, undeclared advisory force, two or 3,000 Soviet advisors, people who were firing Scud missiles and doing other work. Um, but they got out, and while we often in the West, uh, in a shorthand way, declared that the Soviets failed in Afghanistan, of course they did fail, the government that they left behind as a client government led by President Najibullah did not collapse, despite many forecasts that it would. It survived for um, really three years until the spring of 1992, April of 92, it happened to be in Kabul when it fell. And uh, it really only collapsed because the Soviet Union collapsed. The Soviet Union ceased to exist in December of 1991, and so the air bridge of supplies and weapons and money that it had been providing evaporated, and so did political confidence that Najibullah could last, given that the Soviets were no longer there. So uh, that model does, despite the fact that it's ahistorical, it was a completely different setting, and that there were elements of Najibullah's government, its brutality, its lack of accountability, that nobody would choose to model uh, international policy on now. Nonetheless, um, it does offer some uh, historical example that, as a matter of fact, the United States has been drawing upon. Now, what are those examples? Largely, it has to do with military design, military geometry. What is the military geometry by which you make this transition? Uh, there are several elements. The Soviets decided to Afghanize the war around the same time that Gorbachev decided that he was heading out. So they began to build up the Afghan National Army and put it in the lead to the greatest degree possible after 1986-87. Obviously, that is an element of American strategy now. More subtly, there was a sort of geometry of Soviet control in Afghanistan that they tried to convert into a virtue. The Soviets controlled the major cities, Kabul, Jalalabad, Kandahar, Herat, Mazar, the Shindan Air Base, various other towns. They tried to control uh, some of the roads and communication links during the day, and that was about it. But they concentrated on that design, and they reinforced it by building layered ring defenses around the cities. In Kabul's case, they pushed the defense about 25 kilometers outside of the capital. Now, the armed opposition, the Mujahideen, who were being financed by the United States, Saudi Arabia, and Pakistan, and armed, had rockets that could traverse that 25 kilometers, but they were crude and indiscriminate uh, rockets that killed a lot of civilians and weren't very effective other than as terror weapons. So the Soviets uh, managed to exfiltrate their troops, get out of the country by concentrating on population centers, urban centers, and communication links. And that is very much what the Americans are up to now. Now, there's some variations on the theme. They are uh, perhaps more self-consciously involved in a forward defense, as a military person might call it. They have a more active approach to the Pakistan border. They're building up border security forces. They're trying to um, create a layered defense that's a lot bigger than 25 kilometers outside of Kabul, so that if you try to come down from North Waziristan, you're going to run through a lot of, of pickets before you can reach the capital. Yes, there are uh, also, special operations forces, helicopter-borne raids, and, and attempts to target Taliban leadership that are perhaps more active and more effective than the Soviet uh, forward defenses were. But there are other similarities. They're attempting to build uh, local militias, local police, put men under arms in ways that are also derived from Najibullah's strategy. One of the differences, uh, I think, between the Soviet model and, and what's available to uh, NATO today has to do with leadership. Najibullah was a thug. He was a secret police chief, had a lot of blood on his hands. He was not a figure of national unity uh, in Afghanistan, but uh, he was a tough and increasingly clever survivalist who managed to adapt to the end of the Cold War by converting himself from a communist into a nationalist. And he was able to build a lot of uh, allies, unexpected allies, in lots of places around Afghanistan, partly because Many Afghans feared the alternative uh, in the form of Gulbuddin Hekmadiyar and other uh, Islamist leaders who they, who Najibullah continually reminded, as many people who, who, who he could speak to over the radio and in public speeches, uh, you know, you may not respect everything that I did, uh, but you really want to be ruled by them. And that anxiety uh, was binding uh, in a significant way. Um, now, 
The United States doesn't have an ally uh, with Najibullah's muscle and strength and um, determination, frankly. Um, you know, President Karzai has virtues, but they are not of this character. Uh, he has not uh, built um, the kind of strength and credibility around Afghanistan that uh, Najibullah was able to do. And so that question of how the center of Afghanistan will be led after 2014, who will really provide the narrative, the leadership, the strategy in Afghan terms for political unity, for at least this geometry of cities and roads to hold as combat forces are reduced. Karzai is meant to leave office in 2014, so really this is a mission that falls as much to his successor as to him, and uh, it's not obvious where that leadership will come from or what its character will be. Uh, the second model that's influenced U.S. exit strategy, I think, as I mentioned, is, is Iraq. And, and the main thing I want to uh, emphasize there is this conviction that uh, the United States brought to the surge in 2009, uh, principally a conviction held by uh, its important military architect, General David Petraeus, who had commanded the surge into Baghdad in 2007, where against you know, very heavy odds, uh, U.S. forces of about 20,000 strong intervened in an urban civil sectarian war in Baghdad, stabilized it, and set conditions for the final uh, withdrawal, of America, withdrawal of American troops. I think that um, model, which Petraeus literally brought with him in his head, uh, in his personal experience, in his sweat and blood uh, from Iraq, he brought it to Afghanistan. And if there was a single element of that model that I think drove his decision making. It was the belief that local, local militia forces, local police, the conversion of combatants into security forces could be achieved in Afghanistan the way it had been achieved in, in Iraq. Now, Petraeus is a very bright man, and I think he knew intellectually that Afghanistan was not Iraq. He often said, Afghanistan is not Iraq. I'm not going to overinterpret my Iraq experience. But the truth is that he emphasized quite a lot of the same programs and made many of the same assumptions that he'd made in Iraq. Now, one thing that I uh, believe was flawed in that approach was to do with the differences in the, in the social and political structures in the two countries. When the Sunni tribes in Anbar and uh, western Iraq changed sides in that war under pressure from the United States and in the very specific context of the surge, they were able to do so in a unified way because those tribes essentially had not been um, molested in decades. Authority, social authority was intact, tribal, tribal authority was intact. When they flipped the switch in Anbar, the electricity ran down through those tribes without a lot of breakers and everybody turned. Saddam had never even bothered these tribes. They had their own smuggling rackets. They had their own territory. He ruled through uh, co-optation and alliance, but he did not move against them militarily. They were his allies. So when they turned, they turned coherently. Now, in Afghanistan, there is no analog to that. There simply is no way for the electricity to run cleanly through any set of social uh, or informal authorities, tribal or otherwise, in a way comparable. Now, I think as General Petraeus settled in, he came to recognize this, but that didn't cause the plan to change. Instead, they just adapted. Well, all right, let's go one valley at a time. We'll just do this one valley at a time. But it was the same method. Bottom-up reintegration was the term. Now, the record is that not very many Taliban fighters of any significance have come in under this reintegration program. And really today, you don't even hear the term two years later being used very actively as a central, cent centerpiece of American policy. Instead, uh, rather suddenly, the political strategy has migrated towards top-down political reconciliation, talking directly to the Taliban in the hope that some sort of grand bargain or partial grand bargain can be achieved. In 2009, when President Obama took office, he tried to fulfill a promise that he'd made during the election campaign of 2008, which was that he was going to fix the Afghan war. 
was the good war. Part of his argument against uh, his opponent in the 2008 election was that the Bush administration, and by implication John McCain, who, uh, though independent-minded, was the Republican nominee, had squandered American resources and potential by invading Iraq, a war that Obama had opposed, and that one of the consequences of this mistake, apart from all of the lives and treasure, was that the United States had neglected the Afghan war, had allowed Osama bin Laden to remain at large, had allowed al-Qaeda to revive itself along the Afghan-Pakistan border, and that if he were elected president, he would do something about this by getting out of Iraq and shifting to Afghanistan. That was the narrative of the campaign, and he was elected on that basis. And so when he came to office, he followed through. The military, having heard his, um, the American military, having heard his campaign promises, was there literally on the second day that he took office with a plan. And that is the plan that is the foundation of this exit strategy that we have today. Now, literally, it was a plan in the sense that when the United States military conducts complex operations involving the dispatch of uh, many tens of thousands of additional forces, it writes a campaign plan. That campaign plan has to have reasonable visibility over a period of months. It can't just be for six weeks or three months. And essentially, it's a two-year construct. Now, in thinking about where we are today and what is ahead by way of transition in Afghanistan, I think it's important to understand what some of the assumptions of that campaign plan were. One of the assumptions was that the south of Afghanistan, where Canadian forces had served in Kandahar, that this should be understood as the center of gravity. That was a phrase that was often used, because it was where the Taliban had been born and where they had uh, historical origins and credibility, and that the best way to break the momentum of the Taliban was to attack their center of gravity in the south, in Kandahar and Helmand. Now, there were alternatives to that approach such as concentrating on the Pakistan border in the east, going after the Haqqanis, trying to connect, uh, trying to protect this long frontier from infiltration. And there were arguments about whether it made sense to, first of all, conceive of Kandahar as anything like a center of gravity, and if you did conceive of it that way, whether it made sense to attack it militarily or, or to try to affect it by other means. But that was an assumption. The second assumption was that the Afghan National Army, which is an institution with a long history in Afghanistan, and between roughly 1930 and 1975, it was a successful institution, multi-ethnic, um, at, at peace with its neighbors, a professional army, uh, 70,000, 80,000 numbers varied and are not easy to document, but an army of uh, scale and some stability, and certainly an institution of national prestige and pride. Uh, the, the assumption of the campaign plan was that that army, which had been decimated and dissolved essentially during 30 years of war, and more or less ignored after, in the first years after uh, September 11, could be built up to hundreds of thousands of men under arms, led by competent officers, by 2014. That, as in Iraq, where a similar scaling up of Iraqi military forces was a linchpin of U.S. policy after 2005, that this could be achieved in Afghanistan. So that's another assumption. Another, a third assumption was that Afghanistan would be stable enough politically in Kabul, in the constitutional arrangements of power sharing at the center, stable enough politically to allow a transition of security forces to occur as early as 2014. As I've already mentioned, another assumption was that reintegration would work, that these militia strategies, partly derived from Najibullah's example, partly derived from the Iraq example, that they could provide a layered local security that would gradually squeeze the Taliban out of many of the areas that they were infiltrating. Another assumption was that a civilian surge, as it was termed, the dispatch of diplomats, aid workers, agricultural officers, others, would supplement uh, the Afghan government and provide meaningful governance uh, in the areas where the surging troops arrived, and that this would allow, ultimately, um, a more effective connection between the Afghan population and the government in Kabul, 
which, which would itself create a, vir a sort of virtuous circle, as they say in business, where the international troops would be able to hand off to Afghan lead, buoyed by this improved governance and the civilian surge. And finally, there was an explicit finding in the campaign plan that this strategy could succeed even if the problem of Taliban sanctuary in Pakistan was not addressed. Essentially, the assumption of the campaign plan was if the, if the Taliban's use of Pakistan did not get any worse, this could work. Now, I think that's probably eight assumptions I've listed for you. You know, hands up, are there any of them that seem uh, to have been borne out by events? Maybe you can argue for part of one or two. But quite a lot of the assumptions on which this uh, campaign plan was constructed uh, have proved to be um, wrong, not to put too fine a word on it. Now, what is, what is to be done? Then? I think the first thing is to understand, honestly, that some of this uh, plan has been based on poor assumptions and to adjust. Because one of the bad habits of Western government, especially big military bureaucracies, is to operate on a kind of automatic pilot where it's just inconvenient to take stock of poor assumptions, fundamentals that turned out to be wrong. Look, people make mistakes. People make honest judgments that turn out to be wrong. It is not a crime to be wrong. But it is tragic to proceed on the basis of assumptions that turned out to be incorrect simply because it looks hard to start over again and to scrub the blackboard and to start thinking about how you adjust. And particularly after uh, 10 years of uh, war in the midst of an economic crisis that is uh, most severe in a generation or more in the United States and in much of the Western world, and for all the reasons of exhaustion um, that are familiar, I'm sure, in Canada, it's just easy to blame the Afghans, blame the Pakistanis, hope for the best, and just continue down the track. And I do think that that is um, unjustifiable myself. Now, I think there are uh, a number of big questions looking ahead that you would want to take account of if you were to reset and to come to terms with the difficulties uh, that have obviously manifested themselves in the, in, the, in the exit strategy that we have to date. The first big question is, how long can the center of Afghan politics hold together? And what can be done to reinforce it? This really was uh, something that Najibullah uh, achieved, at least in the geometry of these cities and linked roads that I described earlier. The Pakistan army, I think, is proceeding now from an assumption as it manages its relationship with the Taliban that Afghan national security forces will not, in fact, hold together beyond 2016 or 2018 at best. And in fact, uh, there's some danger that the whole enterprise of training and equipping these forces could, could fail before then, as events of this last week have suggested. Armies require a body politic to be loyal to. They require a reason to hold together and to fight and to, and to put a national cause above other sources of identity, whether those are regional or sectarian or tribal or otherwise. The Afghan army requires a politics to be loyal to. It will come under pressure, certainly. It will not be a world... Um, class military and its internal stability or its performance. But fundamentally, will it hold together in a political sense? Now, there are sources of potential disunity already being sown in the army. Partly, there's not confidence that all Afghan uh, groups can participate in leading these um, units equally. So you have quite a lot of um, imbalance in, a, in an ethnic or a regional sense in the army. 
but perhaps even more dangerous is the extent to which I think the cronyism and corruption and factionalism and family-based politics that have too often characterized the palace in Kabul are now finding their way into appointments and the management of the army. If the army becomes a fief of corrupt individuals who use appointments or key generalships to protect their own interests rather than the country's interests, then its durability is doubtful. <laughs> a second question, who will succeed President Karzai and how will this transition be constructed in 2014? It's sort of odd as a Washingtonian to read the paper, cover Afghan, follow Afghanistan so closely. You would think that the only thing happening in Afghanistan in 2014 is the reduction of NATO combat troops. You would think that the only thing happening politically in Afghanistan are talks with the Taliban. In fact, Afghanistan is scheduled to have what looks on paper to be a very challenging presidential election in 2014, where President Karzai is constitutionally prohibited from running again but there is really no visibility on how his successor is going to be designated or how the palace is going to use its juice, its networks, its contracting networks, its allies, its vote banks to anoint a successor, pick somebody out. There are lots of people floating around President Karzai now who think that they're the chosen one who's going to be tapped on the shoulder by him and get the benefits of his access to international resources and so forth. But Karzai is dodgy. He's not really committing himself. He's protecting himself. He's protecting his family. It's not unusual in these settings. To, these are, as uh, somebody uh, put it to me the other day when I was talking about this, these are cruel politics. They're dangerous for, for Karzai. So, of course, he's managing his interests. But the consequences uh, are potentially divisive. Remember, in 2009, Documented fraud in the election created a near crisis in the country. The fraud was probably unnecessary. If there had been a clean vote, Karzai probably would have won election, maybe even in the first round, certainly in the second round. But instead, as evidence gathered by the international community demonstrated, he stole the election. Now, what happened? The leader of the opposition, Abdullah Abdullah, who, while he didn't represent a unified opposition, he represented a pretty sizable uh, chunk of it. What did, how did he respond to this fraud? Well, he stood in his rose garden in Kabul and held press conferences where he expected, expressed his disapproval of Karzai's behavior. Not a single militia was mobilized, not a rock was thrown, not a window was broken. Why? It's like that Sherlock Holmes story about the dog that didn't bark. It had to do with a horse that was being stolen. The story's called Silver Blaze. Go read it. It's good. Uh, but the dog didn't bark because the incentive structure in Afghanistan, the presence of the international community, the seeming commitment of the international community in 2009 to stay, the international community was increasing its investments in Afghanistan. And whether you were a patriot and a nationalist, or whether you were a venal contractor or just wanted a piece of the action, or whether you were a combination of those things, the incentive structure was, hang on, this train is coming to town. There's no reason to burn down the station. So everybody held their place and accepted what in other countries would have been an unacceptable degree of fraud, electoral fraud. Remembering Kenya in 2007, the election was stolen and the whole country burned down. Now, what's going to happen in 2014 if the Karzai machine or some version of it steals the vote again? Do we really think that all of the Afghan uh, participants in power sharing and political competition are just going to accept it again, that there's going to be no violence, no mobilization as a result of this. Of course, Afghans are cautious and scarred by all of this war and suffering and violence. Nobody welcomes another round of civil war. That it is an important source of constraint on violent actors. But the incentive structure has changed. The international community is heading for the exit. The time is now. This is seize the day time in 2014. So if the international community does not commit itself to a fair and uh, secure and inclusive election, which would be 
in the best of circumstances, a very difficult project, but to which the international community is committed on paper and by constitutional terms and through its involvement in the country, it may end up uh, with a crisis that will make hotel talks with the Taliban and Qatar seem kind of quaint and irrelevant to what really is going on in uh, political Afghanistan. The time is now to focus on this constitutional transition. There are many hard questions to be managed. A lot of confidence would have to be rebuilt. It may be too late, but the idea that political strategy in Afghanistan should simply be based on this Hail Mary negotiation with the Taliban uh, and not focused on the constitutional transition that is already scheduled and whose consequences are known uh, seems to be um, mistaken. Another big question, and I'll, I'll wind up here. What is Plan B? I talked before about the assumptions and their um, potential flaws, actual flaws. If the assumptions on which the exit strategy is being con conducted are at least partly wrong in the way that I've asserted, I'm not saying I'm right, but I'm saying that's my argument, then how, does that mean you just give up? Does that mean you just land the jets, board and leave? Of course not. But it does mean you have to come to terms with alternative pathways rapidly. And can NATO governments, the United States in particular, find the candor and the courage to change course and mitigate a failure of their own making? Can they take this on in a pragmatic, honest way, or will they just blame the locals, wash their hands, and get out as fast as they can? That's a question of leadership. Finally, um, I'm a big uh, skeptic of conventional wisdom wherever it's encountered, and it doesn't mean that conventional wisdom is always wrong, but I do think that all of us uh, as you know, students and independent thinkers and scholars here or others, you have a duty almost uh, when something, when a sort of point of view congeals, everyone assumes that something is the case. It's usually useful to step outside of it and ask what's the alternative uh, to this assumption. And one of the pieces of conventional wisdom now uh, is that um, Pakistan's position in this war should be managed the way you would manage that of a total adversary. That the best way to deal with Pakistan now is to recognize the truth that it's on the other side of the war, uh, that it's been dishonest in its conduct and policies, and that it should be isolated and essentially um, attacked unilaterally if necessary. I think it's worth questioning this conventional wisdom, which is grounded in a great deal of emotion on both sides. Pakistan and its army have a long record of overreach, interference, and violence in Afghanistan that, is, that it is accountable for. And that record of overreach, interference, and violence continues to this day. But Pakistan and Afghanistan are share a very large overlapping population and a very long border. Pakistan's own stability is critical to Afghanistan's potential to enjoy peace and stability. It is simply not possible to take a broom and sweep Pakistan out of the picture, which is, I'm afraid, often the emotional instinct uh, in Washington and elsewhere. The truth is that most Pakistanis, certainly civilians um, in politics, and even sections of the army, recognize that Pakistan's own stability will be put at risk. They won't necessarily admit this in public, but Pakistan's own stability will be put at grave risk if, as a result of the failure of the U.S. exit strategy, Afghanistan descends into another round of civil war. It's almost inevitable that that war will wash onto Pakistani soil and that stronger and more numerous groups of insurgents than already exist will be aimed at Islamabad. So the irony is that the United States, Afghanistan, and Pakistan actually have more shared interests at this stage of the post-9-11 Afghan conflict, more shared interests in stability, in managing a successful, stable transition, than they've had arguably at any previous stage of the conflict. 
but cooperation has collapsed. And it's collapsed in an emotional cloud of mutual resentments. Very difficult to easily see how it will restart. So let me just conclude um, and take your questions. Look, the United States is uh, not likely to undertake another expeditionary counterinsurgency campaign led by its army anywhere in the world for a generation or more, barring an extraordinary event that caused a U.S. president to decide this was required. The costs of the mistakes in Iraq and Afghanistan are shared. The failures of policy are ones in which there are many complicit parties. But the United States did arrive in Afghanistan in 2001 in the recognition that it had ignored during the dark period of the 1990s that American security and Afghan security were linked. In fact, it turned out that they were inextricably linked as the events of September 11th demonstrated, that it was not possible to allow Afghanistan to simply fester as it did in the 1990s under the rule of the Taliban, enduring humanitarian crises that toward the end included famine, enduring international isolation and um, a long record of unmitigated uh, war, to just allow that to persist without it affecting the rest of the international community. That was not a sustainable approach because it failed to recognize that in this world, the security of peoples is more closely linked than at any stage in human history. So we're back there again. This exit tr strategy has to occur. The transition will occur. But will it be undertaken with uh, the clarity that the security of the Afghan people and the security of Canadians and Americans will remain linked. And so there is, a, I think, a very compelling um, shared project that there's no excuse uh, not to undertake. So thank you uh, very much for your patience and, and for listening. Happy